Cetuximab, of course, is a monoclonal antibody directed against the epidermal growth factor receptor. And in terms of how it works or its mechanism of action, we've come to realize that it's actually a dual mechanism. Uh, first, it's a mechanism against the target, uh, a target that we know is important in head and neck cancer. It's important to its biology. It has prognostic implications. Uh, and uh, we've targeted it. And in fact, cetuximab is the only approved targeted agent for uh, head and neck cancer. And when we, when we inhibit uh, EGFR with a drug like cetuximab, what we see is a reduction in proliferation, uh, a reduction in metastatic potential, a reduction in angiogenesis, really all the things we want to reverse in the cancer uh, phenotype. But we also have to realize that there's another end to the monoclonal antibody, and that's the end that interacts with immune cells and that can actually activate a part of the immune system called uh, antibody-dependent cytotoxic, uh, cytotoxicity, uh, and, um, and that involves uh, primarily natural killer cells. And so studies for the last several years have really borne this out, that cetuximab uh, has a dramatic effect on activating this immune system. And in fact, there are some investigators and some research that, researchers that think that that's, in fact, the more important mechanism of action for cetuximab. Whether that's true is still debated, but I think, um, without a doubt, there is an immune component to its mechanism of action. In fact, we published a study with the University of Maryland uh, just last year that uh, had patients who were treated with cetuximab, and we were able to demonstrate that those patients in an ex vivo assay who could form an immune response based on ADCC, based on natural killer cell activation, who could form this immune response to cetuximab actually did significantly better with cetuximab therapy than their counterparts that could not, suggesting that in fact the immune component is quite an important part of the mechanism of action. The use of cetuximab for patients with head and neck cancer has really uh, had dramatic uh, effect and, and certainly significant effect on the outcome of these patients. Let's talk about first the patients with locally advanced disease. And what we know about cetuximab is that it is a radio sensitizer and a good radio sensitizer that improves survival when added to radiation in patients with locally advanced head and neck cancer. That survival was first seen at three years, about 10% difference in survival, and then a later publication at five years, and again, maintaining that same 10% improvement in overall survival. And although that number, I agree, is modest, we also have to remember that that means that we're curing 10% more patients with the disease, so really a difference in those patients between life and death. And of course, that garnered approval for cetuximab in patients with locally advanced disease. Interestingly, in that same uh, setting, locally advanced, when we combined cetuximab with chemotherapy and radiation, specifically with cisplatin radiation, we didn't see a beneficial effect. And the reason behind that is still unknown, but uh, what we do know is that cetuximab is best used as a single agent with radiation, and now should not be combined with chemotherapy radiation. In fact, that only leads to more toxicity and no benefit in terms of efficacy. I think that cetuximab may actually be a fairly underused drug in combination with radiotherapy. When the Bonner study came out, um, I think the absence of extreme toxicity led some to consider the regimen to have a little less oomph. The failure to do a study comparing against cisplatin with radiotherapy left many practitioners wondering um, which was the better regimen. And I think the subgroup analysis on that trial was a little bit confusing. Um, Preclinically, there's reason to believe that cetuximab might work a little less well for the HPV-positive patient. And yet in Bonner, they seem to be describing the HPV-positive uh, uh, patient in the, um, in the forest plots of who benefited uh, more. We now have that HPV subgroup data. It's fairly agnostic, the efficacy of cetuximab. In my practice, I've actually had a very good experience with uh, the agent. I found it very well tolerated, almost as well tolerated uh, as radiation alone. Surely, certainly um, uh, quite a bit better tolerated than bolus cisplatin um, with uh, radiotherapy. And it has a positive phase three study behind it. So in my practice, I've seen it as a very viable option. 
Conversely, when we look at patients with recurrent metastatic disease, uh, we can see that cetuximab is effective in really two ways, or adds to our efficacy. First of all, as a single agent, uh, it has a response rate of about 10 to 15 percent, and is approved as a single agent for second-line recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer. Perhaps more importantly, it improves survival in patients in the first-line recurrent metastatic when combined with chemotherapy. So this is the so-called extreme regimen that combined cetuximab with platinum and 5-FU compared to cisplatin or platinum and 5-FU alone. And what the investigators saw was a improvement in overall survival from median seven and a half months with chemotherapy alone to a median of about 10 months with the addition of cetuximab. And of course, the extreme regimen is approved for the treatment of first-line recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer in the United States and in Europe. In my practice, uh, I do frequently use uh, cetuximab for palliative care. For the patient with very low bulk disease that's not imminently threatening their well-being, I like single-agent cetuximab as a very well-tolerated uh, regimen uh, to try to uh, control disease in such patients. The other way I use it is for more aggressive palliative regimen. I will graft it onto chemotherapy, just not the very toxic cisplatin 5-FU backbone shown in the extreme study. In my personal practice for the patient that has a great need of a response, I like to graft it onto weekly carboplatin and paclitaxel, kind of uh, employing the Keys uh, neoadjuvant regimen as a palliative uh, approach. We happen to be filming in the southeast of the United States where there's a 20% anaphylaxis rate. I will say about that that there is an alpha-gal assay that can be used to predict against these. Negative predictive value, uh, negative predictive value is excellent, 100%. That's about to be published in the journal Cancer. Positive predictive value, we really don't know. But in my practice, I will get an alpha-gal if it's negative. I'm very comfortable treating the patient with cetuximab. If it's positive, we use Benadryl premeds. We use steroid premeds. And because just about all of these reactions happen in the first 15 minutes of the first infusion, I personally supervise the infusion of the first 15 minutes. With respect to trying to manage the radiation dermatitis, what, what we've realized is that if we get on it early, so if we begin to manage it very early, uh, we're much more successful. Uh, and that includes uh, tetracycline antibiotics, uh, topical therapies. Um, of course, we have to be careful with topical therapies when using radiation because they cannot be applied uh, during the uh, radiation administration. Um, and if, if we do that, uh, of course, it's good skin hygiene, uh, uh, good, good skin uh, hydration. Uh, and if we do that, we've really learned that we can avoid the more serious uh, grade four radiation dermatitis that can be associated with cetuximab and even, even sometimes avoid the grade three dermatitis that can be associated. So really the key is to begin management very early.